Thank you, Avi, for really covering an immense amount of ground in a very tight um, schedule and a tight time. Um, I think that we really um, appreciate how much you were able to pack into here because I think that when we think about the really the way the Luxembourg Agreement had to be applied in different ways and different contexts than it was originally was conceived, um, and you were able to give us a sense of covering that, covering the change in definitions that were required, covering the further extent of the scope of persecution, um, and how all that was built on the original um, and worked off the original conception, the original agreement. I think uh, I thank you for that picture that, that you were able to give us. Um, and I guess my personal note I'll add was that seeing Raul Hilberg's name, they reminded me that when I first began, I took a seminar with Hilberg. And it's interesting today to see how little um, he is referred to in so many ways. Donnie Michman has just written about that a little bit. Um, but you know, the person who once really created the field in many ways um, has uh, really been superseded by more recent interpretations and contexts. Um, our next speaker is Professor Stefan Christian Inesco, who is currently the Theodore Zev and Alice R. Weiss uh, Holocaust Education Foundation, visiting associate professor in Holocaust Studies at Northwestern University. He's the author of several book chapters and articles in such journals as Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Nationalities Papers, the Journal of Ethnicity and Nationalism, Journal of Genocide Research, Holocaust Studies, a Journal of History and Culture, and Yad Vashem Studies. Professor Ionescu's book entitled Jewish Resistance to Romanization, 1940-1944, was published by Paul Grave Macmillan in 2015, and currently he's finishing a book manuscript entitled Restitution of Jewish Property in Post-War Romania, 1944-1950. Stefan, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for this generous introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers, Professor Stauber, um, and all your colleagues and Claims Conference for putting together this wonderful conference. And um, for me, it's especially meaningful to be here to participate in this conference, where Claims Conference has such an important role. Um, part of my, I mean, my current research, of which my paper belongs to, um, was started when I was a fellow. I had a fellowship from Claims Conference entitled Saul Kagan Fellowship for Advanced Shoah Studies. And um, uh, okay. uh, the other one. Um, okay. Okay. I will use this one. Um, and um, so thank you very much for that. Um, before I start, um, I have to um, to Mark's request to say something maybe interesting um, about uh, me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, nothing shocking, but um, <laughs> as you noted, my last name is um, Ionescu, right? And perhaps if you met other Romanians, you've noted that many Romanian last name end up in Escu. It's like, a, like something contagious, a plague, perhaps. Um, and um, some years ago, when I started my first job in California, uh, part of my contract, I had to deliver a lecture annual lecture and um, I was very proud I prepared a lot for the lecture and the university advertised the huge billboards in the campus I was very proud uh, very late I've noticed that they misspelled my name my last name so instead of UNESCO they wrote Antonescu which is a <laughs> wartime dictator of Romania so I had to start my lecture with a disclaimer that uh, I'm not related to uh, our yeah terrible dictator um, having said that um, I will perhaps um, prepare to start my um, presentation today uh, just to say that this is part of a broader book project uh, entitled um, Restitution of Jewish Property in Post-Holocaust Romania um, that hopefully will be published. I'll just make it full so, Sorry. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, and without further ado, I will start. Um, yeah, okay. uh, just to show you here, it's um, actually a flyer that was distributed uh, during the Holocaust in Romania by this Romanization agency, uh, Centro Nacional de Romanizare, uh, it says, for rent. This was uh, um, put on houses that were basically confiscated, expropriated from Jews uh, to advertise for potential um, uh, Gentile tenants uh, who um, could find fancy on specific houses. Um, cities were full of this um, 
type of notes. Um, so, my paper today is entitled Courts Reversing Robbery, Implementing the Reversal of Romanization of Jewish Property, 1944-1950. After the putsch that toppled Marshal Ion Antonescu's anti-Semitic and genocidal dictatorship in August 1944, Romania changed sides. It abandoned the Axis and joined the Allies. Before it became a full-fledged, this is our wartime dictator, that is not my relative. Um, <laughs> before it became a full-fledged communist dictatorship in December 1947, post-Antonescu Romania was ruled by several transitional governments. The first three were coalitions made of four political parties that removed Antonescu, national peasants, liberals, social democrats, and communists, only to be replaced in March 1945 by the pro-communist Popular Front-style coalition headed by Petru Groza. Um, this is a map of Romania, and this is Petru Groza, the pro-communist prime minister. As you see, he doesn't look like a typical proletarian um, <laughs> guy, actually. He was very wealthy yeah, uh, boyar. Um, tensions continues in Romania at political level between these two groups, I mean, the pro-communist coalition and the traditional historical parties, the national peasant, the national liberal parties. Um, in terms of um, Jewish survivors, Jewish survivors expected the abolishment of previous anti-Semitic policies, the criminal indictment of perpetrators, and the restoration of their rights, especially the restitution of property that had been confiscated during the years of Romanianization, 1940-1944. What was this Romanianization that I keep talking about? This was the local equivalent of Nazi Aryanization in a broad sense uh, and mainly entailed the transfer of economic assets, real estate, companies and jobs from Jews to ethnic Romanians through expropriation by the state, redistribution to deserving Romanians and purchases of assets by Gentile profiteers. In this paper I will only focus on individual private property, housing and, housing and companies. Ethnic Romanian refugees, civil servants, skilled workers, various agencies and NGOs, uh, war widows, invalids and veterans were the main beneficiaries of Romanianization. In order to implement this policy, Antonescu established several agencies. You've already seen one, Centro Nacional de Romanizare, National Romanization Center, and adopted a series of laws, such as Decree Law for the Expropriation of Jewish Urban Real Estate from March 1941. One of Antonescu's major projects Romanization aimed to promote economic nationalism and create a strong ethnic Romanian bourgeoisie. While the Romanization agencies failed to confiscate and redistribute the majority of Jewish real estate um, to, or companies to ethnic Romanians during the Antonescu regime, for the most part due to Romania's involvement in the anti-Soviet war, um, the detrimental, detrimental evolution of the war for the Axis and Jewish legal resistance through litigation and camouflage, Tens of thousands of Jews lost their houses in favor of Gentile beneficiaries. My research uncovers the extraordinary untapped story of the Jews mostly successful petitioning to courts and the retrieving of their Romanized assets in the post-war era, even though only temporarily for most of them. By summer 1941, the post-Antonescu transitional government adopted the laws reversing the racial legislation, including Romanization provisions and also adopted the main restitution laws. Law, um, just, these are two main restitution laws in my interpretation. So law 641 from 19 December 1944, please note the date is very early, right? Earlier several sp speakers mentioned the uh, pro-American restitution law in Germany adopted in 1947. Um, this is rather uh, early law, although not early enough for Romanian survivors. If you read the petitions, people were very frustrated that for several months uh, the government didn't seem to be moving uh, in this direction. This was entitled The Law for the Abolishment of Anti-Jewish uh, Legislation, um, but included a lot of restitution um, stipulations. And the second one was Law 607 from August 1945 for the annulment and revocation of some acts that transfer property in exceptional circumstances. Again, very long title, but it refers to those properties that have been sold, allegedly, uh, by Jews to Gentiles. Uh, these laws have been drafted mainly due to foreign policy considerations, such as the government pledge stipulated in the Armistice Agreement to repeal previous discriminatory measures based on political and racial criteria. Its concerns about the Jewish lobby, the peace conference, 
and his goal to obtain better terms concerning Romania's border and co-belligerent status. Although the new regime on paper abolished the Romanization provisions, in practice it allowed restitution only partially and in the short term. The restitution was undermined by major problems in events such as the devastation of war, insufficient personnel at Romanization agencies and contradictory court decisions. Although many properties were successfully returned during the first post-war Antonescu years, restitution was a disorganized and incomplete process. It stopped a few years later when the communist regime uh, seized complete power, obtained control of the Jewish community and implemented new expropriations targeting political enemies and bourgeoisie, such as nationalization of companies in 1948 and nationalization of housing in 1950. In practice, most local Jews used traditional patterns of petitioning developed across history in order to obtain the reversal of Antonescu's dispossessions, especially by petitioning to courts. Even though restitution laws were adopted relatively quickly, as I mentioned, de facto restitution took longer. Typically, to reclaim expropriated real estate, anti-racial legislation required Jews to file a request in court to evict the Romanization profiteers who still live in those houses. Despite formal restitution, some Jewish owners could not move into the houses right away because the restitution laws prolonged the leases of several categories of Romanization beneficiaries, such as retired civil servants, um, invalids, orphans, widows, um, welfare organizations, state institutions of public interest. Uh, they prolonged them several times until April 1948, except in the cases uh, of houses owned by the Jewish working class, war invalids, widows, and of low income. In order to obtain the right to return to their pre-Antonescu houses, Jewish owners and tenants had to prove that they inhabited the houses before the expropriation laws. Thus, the burden of proof fell on the Jewish owners and tenants. Not always the Jewish plaintiffs won their property back. The court system issued sometimes contradictory decisions, especially in the cases of transactions where the Gentiles claimed to have acquired the property through legitimate methods, like purchasing them. Having a skilled lawyer when suing for restitution was crucial for former Jewish owners, especially when they faced some potential hostile judges. For example, the lawyer Miron Butariu, a Gentile lawyer, recollected in his memoirs how he represented a Jewish plaintiff in a, course, in a court in the city of Arad, who requested, I mean, requested the restitution of his house confiscated in 1941. Facing a hostile judge who was a sympathizer of fascist movement, Butariu questioned the magistrate's objectivity based on his fascist past, and as a result, the judge had to recuse himself. The crucial question is, what was the extent of court restitution? And is it I mean, possible to have a grasp of, of the extent of this court restitution during the first post-war years? Overall, because we lack access to full court archives, it is not entirely clear how effective the restitution laws that I mentioned, 641 and 607, um, and what was the proportion of Romanian Jews who managed to recuperate through post-war litigation, the properties they lost, um, expropriated or sold, allegedly, to Gentiles during the Antonescu regime? However, I tried to do something. Um, I found about 147 court decisions, and this court decision showed that Jewish plaintiffs won about 68% of the cases that reached the Supreme Court. Um, if we take into account the court decisions at all level of jurisdiction, I mean all of this 147, um, the Supreme Court, appeals courts, tribunal, judicatoria, local court, the Jewish plaintiffs won um, about 68% yeah, of, of cases, um, while few of them ended up in neutral decisions. While this is not a representative sample for the entire restitution litigation, it is a significant exploratory finding until the court archive will become available. It shows that um, most of the Jewish plaintiffs eventually won their cases, but also that restitution sometimes requires several years of litigation at different jurisdictional levels until a final decision could be reached. The examination of these court documents also showed that most of the Supreme Court decisions were issued in 1945 and 1946, based on law 641 for the expropriated assets, um, and those pro prolonging into 1947, 1948, 1949, were overwhelmingly cases based on law 607, in which former Jewish owners tried to cancel the sale of the assets made under duress. The Supreme Court decision proved that the 
Jewish plaintiffs were very successful in the litigation based on law 641, about 69.6%, um, and largely successful in litigation based on law 607 um, that referred to restitution of properties sold under duress, 62.5%. So fewer cases seem to be uh, won by Jewish plaintiffs and the, among those that were sold. Um, Jewish plaintiffs were very successful at the appeals court, about 75%, um, successful at tribunal level, 65%, um, extremely successful at local court, judicatory, about 80%, 80 but it's a smaller sample here. Um, this suggests that Jewish plaintiffs were more successful at the lower level of, of courts, um, the judiciary, compared to the litigation of the Supreme Court. Um, the court decision that also showed that, um, for example, if we look from a gender perspective, that Jewish women also actively participated in litigation to recuperate their property. Women were plaintiffs in about 28.6% um, of all cases, of which women participated alone as plaintiffs in about 23.8%, uh, while they stood together with their husbands in about 4.7%, uh, almost 5%. Discussing the cases of various European countries, the New York-based American Institute of International Information was particularly concerned in 1946 report about what he saw as the reluctance of the Romanian authorities to honestly address the restitution of Jewish property and the complications of relying mainly on courts to implement restitution. The Institute's representative believed that the Romanian government adopted restitution legislation only formally, but did not really int intend to return the Romanized properties to Jewish owners because it aimed to protect ethnic Romanian profiteers and only a minority of Jewish, um, the former Jewish owners managed to successfully navigate the complicated restitution formalities and recuperate their houses. I'll just uh, read a direct quotation from uh, this report uh, released in 1946. Romania is an example of the futility of legislation under conditions of bad faith and a hostile administration. The legal provisions show an eagerness to protect those who acquired Jewish property at the expense of Jewish owners and the practices of special exemptions, which result exceptions, sorry, which resulted in results in making the laws almost meaningless. Out of the 17,000 confiscated houses, only 5,000 are again in Jewish hands by 1946. As to sales concluded under duress, only those properties which are now in the hands of proven fascists, former government officials, or active members of fascist organizations are annulled. In other cases, the Jewish owner must prove that he suffered a loss of at least 40% the value of the house before his claim would be considered at all. Even if his claim is accepted, not only must he repay the original price, but also indemnify the present possessor for all improvements and expenses. The new owner, however, is permitted to keep all the income he might have derived from the property during these four years of Antonescu regime. Um, end of quotation. One of the most relevant parts of the Institute report is the estimation, probably based on data supplied by Romanian Jewish leaders, that out of the 17,000 houses expropriated by Antonescu regime from which the Jewish owners had been evicted, only 5,000 had been returned to them by 1946. Because even though the laws acknowledged restitution on paper, they stipulated various exceptions and delays, um, and sometimes the implementation by the judiciary had been hostile. During the next years, the restitution seemed to be increasing um, significantly because by April 1948, the exemptions in favor of specific categories of privileged Romanization tenants uh, ended and the courts continued to rule in favor of the former Jewish owners and tenants. But it didn't go for long. For example, the last court decision I found is from spring 1949. From that moment, I didn't find anything. So it's maybe there are somewhere, but um, I could not find them. Um, the Institute correctly argued that the restitution of the property sold under duress was less successful than the restitution of expropriated real estate. Um, because of the conditions required by law 607 regarding the status of buyer, the proportion of financial loss suffered by Jewish owner, and so on and so on. Um, the Institute also had rightly noted that a crucial part of the restitution process took place in, in courts, in local courts, uh, whose procedures were slow and complex, and sometimes the judges were hostile to Jewish claimants, at least during the first post-Antonescu years, which were plagued by uncertainty about the country's political future. Gradually, the court system went through major changes, um, and this probably influenced the litigation, including the one related to Jewish property, because some of the pro-Nazi judges were purged. Well, not all, the majority uh, stay, I think, uh, from what I've seen. Uh, and the remaining ones adapted to the communist regime and its anti-fascist and anti-racist discourse and policies. 
Restitution of Romanized Jewish property by courts was sometimes uh, suspended by the authorities' use of the requisition law. Such cases took place um, when some high officials, including Prime Minister Petro Groza himself, advocated for the requisition of Jewish-owned buildings, including some of those that were recently uh, restituted by courts. While a few government officials understood the difficult situation of Jewish survivors in relation to their property rights, most of them, um, including Prime Minister Petro Groza, were unsympathetic, to say the least, or hostile to the Jews and believed that they believe in a myth depicting local Jews as wealthy old parasites and profiteers from the, at the expense of ethnic Romanians, the economy and society. A particularly false and unfair accusation blamed the Jews for the existing anti-Semitism and chauvinism in Romanian society and for undermining the new people's democracy, at the, the communist regime, which is very bizarre. Um, the prime minister's hostility against the Jews and their alleged privileges might have been caused by the fact that Groza himself was one of the profiteers of Antonescu's romanization of Jewish businesses. I found some documents, including from secret police, that he bought a Jewish factory, like alcohol factory, and, uh, during the war. Um, after Groza party came to power in March 1945, he profited again from Jewish property when he moved in a luxurious villa confiscated from the Jewish industrialist Max Auschnitt, who fled Romania. Uh, this villa is located in a beautiful part of Bucharest. Um, a court decision did not always guarantee that Gentile profiteers would abandon the Jewish houses. They often ignored the Jewish owners, who then had to hire a judicial executor to enforce the decision. Some tenants were very, very influential and refused to obey both the court and the executor. Jews whose houses were occupied, for example, by public institutions such as police or secret intelligence service faced particular difficulties um, and were not really able to move in. Um, to conclude, even though the post antonescu transitional governments formally abolished the Romanization legislation and adopted the laws for the restitution of property rather quickly, by summer 1945, in practice restitution did not proceed smoothly. Romanization beneficiaries and anti-Semitic groups expressed, um, opposed the countermand policies and agitated against the restitution of Jewish property, and the authorities did not seem fully committed to address the injustices done to the Jews. While some Gentiles supported the restitution of property to Jewish survivors, numerous others, I would say the majority, um, especially anti the anti-Semites, beneficiaries of Romanization, opposed the countermand policies and displayed their hostility in public and private settings. Most of the politicians from both political camps struggling for power, you know, the pro-communist and the traditional historical parties, um, agreed to reverse Romanization measures because they saw it as an imperative requirement uh, imposed by the victorious allies through the armistice agreement. Um, here, the, this anti-Semitic myth of world Jewish conspiracy worked very well. They thought that the, both American, British, and the Soviets were puppets, uh, and the Jews were puppeteers. Although many properties were successfully returned during the first post-Antonescu years, overall a fair, complete, rapid, and permanent restitution of property did not take place. The court restitution process ended by 1949-1950, due to a variety of international and domestic events, such as the consolidation of the communist regime its growing confidence due to Soviet support, the signing of the peace treaty in February 1947, and it entered in full force in fall 1947, the new nationalizations and the establishment of Israel. The situation plummeted, especially after December 1947, when the communist regime forced King Michael to abdicate, abolish the monarchy, and seize complete power. The communist massive nationalization policies of, of companies in 1948 and the houses in 1950, targeting mainly political enemies and the bourgeoisie. However, I would argue that many Jewish survivors faced a second expropriation of the assets within a single decade. Even though the communist nationalization um, worsened the lives of many entrepreneurs, property owners, liberal professionals and artisans, regardless of their ethnicity or religious background, um, the Jews who were disproportionately represented in those social categories were particularly affected. My examination of restitution process between 1944 and 1950 shows the significant agency of Jewish survivors, whether notables or ordinary members of the community, who in spite of the numerous obstacles encountered during the post-Antonescu transitional years, worked tirelessly for restitution and often managed to recover the property, only for a short time. Thank you.